So uh, who here knows what OpenWRT is? Anybody who doesn't know? Oh, sweet. Okay, so I'll... I'll so basically, uh, OpenWRT is a build system and Linux distribution for, generally speaking, consumer off-the-shelf routers. Uh, it doesn't support uh, all devices. It supports some devices. So generally, uh, you're looking for a device that comes with Linux on it already because then they have to reveal certain information about drivers and so forth that makes it easier for um, the people who work on OpenWRT to port it to that platform. But uh, typically, uh, OpenWRT will support things with four megabytes of flash or more, or uh, I believe it's a minimum of 16 megabytes of RAM, and uh, the CPU has to have a, uh, an MMU. Uh, they don't really care about things that aren't. Um, uh, as with all things, more is better, but um, there are routers with 128 meg of, of RAM or more uh, these days with modern devices. So um, if you're shopping for a device, if you've got a device, the thing to do is go to the, uh, the OpenWort wiki and see if it's supported already. If you don't have a device, uh, you should also go there and figure out what the hell you should buy. The, the difficulty is, of course, the list is uh, saturated with uh, devices that haven't been made in 10 years. Um, so, you know, it's hit or miss. Uh, typically, you're looking for something with an Atheros radio or a, um, uh, possibly a, a Raylink radio. You want to generally, you want to avoid the Broadcom radio devices because their driver support is much worse. So, why would you want to run OpenWRT? Does anybody does anybody here run OpenWRT now? Awesome. Any, for any particular reason, is it, are you just doing regular routing things? Just like home router, you just replace the, the stock firmware. In my case, yeah. I needed to change my router to uh, access point to my Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, the cool thing is that routers are just little computers with no display, with not very much RAM, not very much storage, but they're computers and they can do an amazing amount of uh, work. And they can, many of them have uh, USB host ports on them now, so you can plug arbitrary devices into them. It's a, you know, you're running Linux, anything with a, a USB driver, you can plug it in, boom, it works just like it would on a PC. I mean, you know, this device has much more memory than my first Linux box had. So, um, you know, they're quite capable and they can do many different things. I've used them for uh, data loggers, um, you know, battery powered things we can put out in the field in a bucket and uh, make measurements from things and record them. And also be, since they typically have uh, a wireless radio built in, you can log into them remotely with, over Wi-Fi and manage them or whatever. So, so those are, that's typically, the reason you would want to put OpenWRT on something is if um, you were trying to do something uh, out of the ordinary. You know, DDWRT, there's alternatives, any device that's, that uh, OpenWRT uh, supports, several other ones typically do. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, like DDWRT. The, the, the distinction with OpenWRT is that it's really um, uh, sort of user-driven. The DDWRT is basically, you want, a route, you want routing software, you want to replace your home gateway router or access point or whatever it is, and you just want software that works better, that has a nicer interface or whatever, and you go and get DDWRT and put it on your router. So OpenWRT is really, its sweet spot is where you want to do something different than that. You want to install some weird software that isn't in the normal builds. And, um, uh, and there's a variety of ways you can do that. So the focus of my talk is going to be basically walking you through how to build and hopefully, if we've got time, flash OpenWRT on a router. Um, uh, if you do, if, if all you want to do is route, you don't need that. You can, you can download uh, stock images and flash them. Um, you can also, if you want, if you're, you know, 
not being adventurous, you can flash the stock open WRT images and just load the packages you want and configure them. But that seems to me boring and uh, lacks challenge and so forth. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to, uh, let's see, oh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what, how OpenWRT's build system is, is constructed. Uh, basically, OpenWRT is a set of um, make files, uh, and this slightly horrific uh, make file hackery based on um, the old build root system for embedded stuff uh, with lots of improvements and and uh, obfuscation and so forth. I have, I have not like penetrated the depths of the makefile hackery. The mysterious things go in and then it works and then you're happy. When it doesn't work, then you start digging and hopefully it starts working before you have to find out how it broke. Um, so typically, um, Open, well, OpenWRT is a set of core packages, core build system stuff and then um, feeds. And feeds are basically just more of these package make files. And it, there's infrastructure for essentially pointing at other sets of these make files and linking them into the build system. So let's see, what am I gonna do here? I'm going to go over. So it's like the open embedded um, It's like that, but it's, Layers so, yeah, kind of, but it's it's a comp open embedded is, you know, uh, they've used whatever the hell the what's the bit bake yeah so this Python recipe stuff, so basically, open word make files are the same recipes but in make file language. Uh, so I'm going to. Um, so the first step is uh, cloning. Um, the, uh, but I'm gonna cheat, hopefully, and get, clone. ah, so I've got a local, so, open. can you see that okay, or should I make it bigger? How's that? That good? Okay. So that's it, there's, um, uh, you got uh, a top make file. You've got um, a bunch of this include thing has a bunch of the make file hackery in it. Uh, there's some scripts. Um, and then target, tool chain, and tools are basically make files for the build system. So the ways this works, you just have a, you have a host built, a normal install pretty much. You have to maybe install a couple extra packages, which it'll tell you about. Um, and it builds the, uh, all the, uh, the tool ch the cross compiling tool chain, and then all the packages for you. So um, let's see. I've got my little cheat sheet here. Git clone. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is uh, you make a copy of this feeds. Dot, um, conf, oops, feeds. Because otherwise it'll get tracked by the Git system, and you don't want that. So let's see feeds. Can you read that? Okay, so we're down uh, source git. So the feeds can be pulled from various places. They can be git rep rep uh, repositories or SVN, or they can, uh, there's some examples down here. Xorg, for example, desktop, FC, and then you can have local uh, trees. So you just make a link to the uh, some local directory. So the next step is you run a script. Scripts, feed, feeds, update, dash A, which goes out and pulls those uh, Git repositories and indexes them in a feeds subdirectory. And this should go fairly quickly. Uh, the next step is uh, you install those, which has the effect of creating sim links in the the top level build directory to all of these make files. And if anybody has any questions, you can interrupt me at any time. Uh, almost done. Can you 
Okay, yeah, we're getting to that. That's coming up. So far, it's just setting things up. Right. So right now, you're essentially to the point where you're, you're prepping the make file system. So uh, that is the next step. So you type. So it uses the, kernel, uh, the Linux kernel config infrastructure. Mostly, I don't know exactly if they, they change it at all. Uh, but they sort of mutate the semantics of some of the selections. So, for example, uh, menu config. So you just saw it going by all these packages you feeds you created. So uh, the first option. So this look, may look familiar to anybody who's configured a kernel. Uh, I'm going to be building for this target, but let's look in here. So there's uh, PowerPC. There's various ARM targets, a bunch of Broadcom targets. There's Freescale, a bunch. Of, um, a bunch. There's x86 down here. x86. You have that pre-selected though, is it not? So right now, Athros is the kind of the primary focus, so it comes up as the default. Okay. I had not pre-selected that. That's how it comes. That's if you don't start. If you don't have a dot config, it'll it'll do that. So under generic. Um, uh, anything with NOR flash that's supported on this is called generic. The other ones, um, you have to cope with the way they create the images, and I'll, I'll cover this a little later, uh, is somewhat unique in the, the startup systems and so forth. But we got generic there, and then we got a bunch of devices in here, and we're going to skip down to Netgear, uh, WNDR, all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you build this on any place we'll find all the goodies or do you need to kind of do a virtual uh, environment in order? You know, we ju I just helped somebody build it on Fedora and it worked pretty well fine and this is Ubuntu and it works fine and Debian works fine. So, I mean, it's all sort of standard build system stuff. Uh, target images. So you have uh, a choice of, of what kind of output you get. Um, most of these we don't need. We're going to build what's called a squash FS file system. So um, the way these typically work is you've got a read-only file system just for compression's sake um, built into the image. You've got a kernel, you've got a, a squash FS, and then whatever's left on the flash gets created, turned into a, a JFFS writable file system. And then that's overlaid over the, the squash FS read-only file system which gives you the appearance of a mutable, you know, it looks like a totally mutable file system. You can delete files, you can create files. Um, if you delete them, uh, you don't recover any flash because it's still baked into that uh, read-only file system. But they're kind of, it's kind of handy because you can track changes you've made. That way you can look at what you've written to open, or the overlay file system and compare them, uh, compare it to whatever was in the, the ROM file system and you can do recursive diffs and so forth and figure out what's changed. Uh, uh, exit. So I'm going to do one other. Uh, uh, what do I need to do? I need to say yes here. So the make system, the system, what you download is just make files uh, which have the OpenWRT make file hackery in it. They don't, you don't have the, the source tar files or whatever they are of the packages that you're building. They're just referred to in the make file system. So as you build them, they get downloaded and built. And uh, typically, I set up a, a download folder. The Oh, what I'm building on is Gen 2, actually, here. So um, uh, it's got user portage dist files that has a, a source tarball directory already. And you can totally reuse that. So uh, I'm going to just. Set this to user portage dist files. And then I do one other thing, and that is enable log files during the build process. And then, uh, and then, what the? You can do that? I, my, I haven't bothered. I have this 16-core this, uh, Intel box at home, so. <laughs> I haven't, 
I've been enjoying that. So let's see. We go down here. Now, Lucy, there's, uh, there used to be a knock on OpenWRT that the, the, um, there was no you know, sexy admin web interface thing. But uh, there's now this thing called Lucy, which is one of those that's perfectly adequate. It looks fine. Um, no reason for complaints. Let's see, and I'll turn on that theme. Uh, and then there are a crap ton of packages in here. Like, if you build all of them with the default feeds, there's like 4,000 packages, and that's cheating slightly because some of them, you know, create individual module things that you can install. Uh, let's just take a look in here. Network. Like, I like uh, IP Route 2. So. Uh, you go down here, routing redirection, and there's IP, and we can say yes there. There's also, I, if you're familiar with uh, kernel menu config, you can s search for things like, um, what do I want, like Perl. And it'll tell you where in the, in the, uh, the menu hierarchy it is and, you, and what its dependencies are and so forth. Uh, let's see, do I want anything else? Not that I can think of. So then you just exit out. You save the, the configuration file. Now, there's this cool kind of little uh, utility. Scripts uh, diff config. And it'll show you just the config changes from the defaults. So you can save that somewhere. And config basic, let's call it. And then later, you can uh, copy that back to config and run make def config. I've never actually done that with a kernel, but I assume that infrastructure is there too. Is that true? Does anybody know? OK. Uh, let's see. Oh, so the fullblown.config is a bunch of lines long, like 4,000. So all these packages aren't set. Um, I'm not going to wade through them. Uh, OK, now I'm going to say time make J32 and enter. So that will take about 10 minutes. And in the meantime, I'm going to switch somewhere else. Oh, so by default, it just gives this sort of uh, very terse indication of what's going on. If you want more, you can take capital V equals S, or actually capital V equals anything, I believe, and you'll get all the build stuff dumped out on the screen, which uh, it turns out with J32 on this box will overrun the screen, and it'll hang. So um, don't do that. Uh, let's see. Is that the right direction? Ah, this is my, yes, logs back up. OK, so, ooh, it's a better place to go. Uh, here, build log. So this is what it's doing now. It builds these various tools for the, the host tool chain stuff. Um, so those are basically host tools. And then it'll build the tool chain, bin utils, GCC, kernel headers, UC libc, uh, you know, at very, in various stages. And then it just starts building the packages one by one and building them into these um, I packages, which ultimately, at the end of the build, get unpacked into a staging root file system, and then that staging root file system is smushed into a squash FS, and the kernels and the this squash FS are glued together, and you end up with an image. Uh, what else was I going to talk about here? Looking at packages, so let me go back over here. Uh, so let me look in feeds, packages, oh, I did it all. 
match. So each package base, oh, well in this case, it's very simple, it's just a make file. Um, there's this infant package name, package version, release version, or package release, and then package source, source URL, and MD5 sum, so once it's downloaded, it checks the hash against the MD5 sum. Uh, and then uh, sets a bunch of these variables, which ultimately uh, gets expanded by this eval call down at the bottom. And it be creates a bunch of make targets for you, which the build system then executes. Um, a typical uh, package would have uh, a patches directory. So if necessary, if you need to patch the package in order for it to, to build, cross uh, build and um, install and I run, you uh, create a set of patches in this patches directory. If you have any config files, you can st stick them in a files directory. Uh, and then the make file, the, this make file is responsible for um, uh, placing those config files wherever they have to be. Um, but the patches all get just applied in the order, in a you know, lexical order inside that directory. So typically they're numbered. Uh, let me see if I can find one. Uh, So, patches. So, you know, they're typical patches. So, they uh, use um, Quilt, or they, they use Quilt infrastructure built into the build system to manage the, the patches. There's a, uh, an excellent wiki page on that, which I keep open in a tab so I can go back and remember how the hell Quilt works uh, whenever I need to do that. Um, those are build doing. It's on the tool chain. So um, when you're building, so suppose uh, you want a custom image for some reason. You want to have, um, as I was talking before, the, uh, the packages are unbuilt into the, the staging root file system. But suppose you want the, the image to come up with stuff that isn't in those packages. The, t the typical way to do that is there's a, um, a files directory, which you can, isn't there by default, but you can create, which is just a tree of files that get overlaid to the root files, the staging root file system, right before it's squashed. So if you've got a, your, your particular config file that you want in there, you know, some tweak thing with a, your host name and, and um, time zone and where you want logging to be sent or whatever you want, you can just put it in this files tree, and that uh, will get mapped right on top of the root file system. Uh, which, and of course, it's not there. OK, so um, maybe while we're waiting for the build, John, I will show you. Oh, yeah. OK, so I'm going to just reboot this. So this is a serial console on this router right here. You see the, the bootloader. It's look at some stages in here. It's looking going out looking to see if there's some um, uh, some net booting option to uh, you know pull a new image or something. And then it doesn't find one, and it, it kicks off the kernel and the init system. And there's a bunch of configuration stuff. So this is a, this particular router is a, w, a Netgear WNDR3800, which is was end of life about a year ago. Um, 
but it's got a, a reasonably fast, fast CPU, 128 meg of RAM, which is much, much better than, you know, some of <laughs> the previous devices we were using. So um, here you can see the revision number of, this. So that's the SVN revision number. Uh, SVN is the revision control system that OpenWort uses, um, you know, it's sort of uh, nominal official repository, but almost nobody uses that. Everybody's using the, the Git mirror of that, which gets synced every 10 minutes. So let's see how we're doing over here. Oops. Okay, not there yet. But uh, what can I show you in here? Ooh, okay. So OpenWRT um, made a choice to basically create an abstraction layer over all software's configuration uh, stuff. So instead of, you know, um, DNS mask having its own configuration file and um, what else, Apache, whatever, uh, you know, they've got their own unique way of creating configurations. And this was causing problems to people who were trying to write web interfaces that would manipulate those configurations. So the OpenWRT people came up with something called UCI. I think it was them anyway. They use it, whether they came up with it or not. Uh, which is just this way of uh, storing configuration information. And it's all stashed in etc. config. And for example, we can look in config network. Uh, and we're just looking at the top here. Um, there's a stanza for each interface. There's a loopback one, and then there's, so they, they also abstract, there's this loopback name, and for example, pub and wan and other things are these sort of uh, meta names for interfaces or sets of interfaces, which OpenWRT uses internally. So you're not using the raw device name that, that Linux knows. Um, loopback, pub. So pub is something I created. The default is LAN. Um, there's a type bridge. It's got a static configuration IP adder. You could look on the, there's a wiki page for this uh, under, if you Google OpenWRT, UCI network, you'll get the whole page of all the different options you can set. Uh, I have, in order to allow me to, this router to get to the interwebs so that I can pull this image down, I have uh, configured well, one of the wireless interfaces to be in client mode to talk to the, the network here, and so I can ping. 4.2.2.2. I can ping. Uh, I'd better be able to ping this because that's where I'm going to get the image. Oh, yeah. So, um, there are lots of, uh, several, a number of files in there, each have their own configuration. So, in addition to just modify, editing these files manually, there's also a command line system uh, called UCI, uh, which you can't quite see all of. So I'll make it slightly smaller, um, which allows you to, to get and set variables um, and so for create new stanzas, sections in the, the configuration files. It also, the way this works is the config files are, are loaded uh, at boot, and you can manipulate the, the configuration without actually saving it back to flash. So you can do a temporary setting, restart a daemon or something, and it'll use the, the temporary setting instead of the, uh, the, the setting that's in flash. Um, uh, so the way the UCI settings are, are uh, used is that the init scripts or whatever that you're using, there's, um, there's a translation layer that will turn those settings back into a, uh, a native uh, config file or command line options. So DNS mask, I think, uses config, uh, the command line options. So it'll just 
constructs this gigantic um, command line and, and launches that. What are we doing over here? Aha, done. Okay, so now I'm going to, let me see if I've got this in there. Let's copy. Ha ha. No, that's not what I wanted. Ah, so when it's done, let me do this first. Bin. Under, under the AR71. So, so, so it's the bin and then the, the target uh, architecture, essentially. And here are all your images. There's, uh, there's kernels, there's some U-boot stuff, but really all you need is these, um, these images here. The uh, squash F sys upgrade, in that case, that's what we're going to be using. If you had the stock firmware on there initially, you can use the, the dash factory image and upload it using whatever um, you know, web interface comes with the, the device. So let's copy in AR that Russell at non. I'm having to do a little jujitsu because that image is not or that machine isn't uh, accessible from outside. And Oops. Better. Okay, then we can go back over here. So to reflash, once the thing, once you've got OpenWRT installed on the thing, you can copy the image to uh, the temp directory, which is a RAM disk. Uh, how am I doing on that? Oh, Russell at nod personal telco dot net temp, uh, and then just for good measure. And how am I doing? Seventeen seconds. Oh not done. It is done. There we go. So boom. So there's the image there. Open WRT error 71X generic WNDR 3800 blah blah blah. So then you just say sys upgrade dash V dash N. So dash Dash N means um, ignore any current settings. Now, so there's, if you've got a configuration file or any file that's been registered by a package as a uh, file to be preserved, when you launch the sysupgrade script, it'll go package it into a tarball, write the image, and then right behind it, it'll write the tarball. And then when it boots the first time, it'll look for that tarball, and if it, it'll copy it back to a RAM disk, create the, the rewritable JFFS file system, and then unpack whatever's in the tarball into that JFFS overlay. But I don't, I'm not going to do that this time. So I'm going to say open word. And then boom. And it'll take about, um, three minutes to come back up again, during which I could talk about something else. <coughs> Showing, copying, and I talked about the, okay, um, somewhere. Uh, boot log. So um, this again is what we saw scrolling by earlier. This is just the thing booting. There's some important information. If you're, if you're writing over a device, uh, there's uh, a limited number of things that can go wrong. Uh, you can flash the wrong image, in which case um, some bad things can happen. It's very rare to actually stomp on the bootloader. If the bootloader is intact, you can recover. Uh, either with a serial console or maybe if you're lucky with um, some sort of TFDP, TFDP um, 
you know, pushing the reset button to get into the right mode or catching it, you know, as it's booting, depending on the device. Uh, there, are, there are other parts that are often uh, stashed away on flash that are kind of essential, one of which is um, uh, the radio um, calibration data. So the, the kind of C, uh, the, the parts, the SOCs with the radios built in will come down the assembly line and at some point they'll get hooked into a, a fixture and the radio will get tuned. And all that data, which is unique to that part, uh, will get stashed away in a little part of flash. So um, you don't want to overwrite that or your radio might not work. So if you're starting out with a device and you want to make sure that the thing continues to work while you're figuring out um, you know, what you're doing, uh, it's good to try to get an, a complete image off the device first. So if you've got a serial console or if there's a way to Telnet or SSH into the device, you can oftentimes, um, there's a, uh, let's see if I've got my console over here. Oh, hey, did it boot? Yeah, so we're, we're back, the, the revision number changed. Ah, so it's still booting. It's um, just finished creating the JFFS2. So now I've got a completely writable file system. I can go DF. And I've got, uh, in the overlay, I've got like 12 megabytes of, of writable flash. Um, but I was talking about something else. And that was, oh, so dev, oops. These MTD devices are the flash partitions. And the, the flash partitions, the partition table in these things is typically uh, hard-coded into the kernel. So it's not looking on, it's not like on a disk where there's a partition table and it tells it where everything's laid out. Uh, something in the kernel is telling, or you know, in a device tree or some crazy thing like that, uh, is telling it where the, the partitions are. Um, when you boot um, another image somewhere in here, it will tell you the actual layout of the flash. So here's this U-boot goes from, you know, X zero to hex something, five something, and, uh, and then down here. So, so if you have that information, you know where you would need to copy parts of the flash back to. Um, oftentimes there's a uh, partition, or there's one of these MTT devices which maps to the entire flash part. And you can, what I try to do is, before I've flashed anything, get into the device and make a, an image of all those flash devices, uh, partitions, and stash them away somewhere so that if I have to, I can get back in and fix it. Um, Uh-huh. Um, temp director. Okay, so overlay. Let's look at that. Find. So those are all the um, files and or directories that oh, so let me talk about UCI defaults a little bit. So there's um, there's a set of scripts that can get get initially flashed in this UCI defaults. And they're designed to be run once. So um, when the device boots up, it looks in that directory. It says, oh, there's a script there. I should run it. It can do anything. It's just a shell script. And if it exits with status 0, then that script is deleted out of that directory. Uh, so if it fails, it'll try again. If it succeeds, it'll get removed and won't be run again. If you install a package later, uh, it'll dump a file in there if it needs it, and it'll get run and then deleted. So that's another uh, way of creating um, sort of configuration changes, custom uh, configuration changes 
uh, in the image that you're flashing by creating these UCI default scripts. Uh, what else? Any, any questions so far or at all? Yes? Is, um, what the, the scope of different tasks that you can apply this distro to? Do you do it to make a max point or something aside from just serving? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, so there's, there's 4,000, I mean, uh, there are, like I said, 4,000 packages that are run the gamut. I mean, they're every imaginable open source. If it comes in a source tarball or Git tree or something, you can probably build it for this. Now, it might not have enough resources to run, but it'll build. And, you know, you got source code, you got a, a cross compiler, you're done. If you want to, if you know, there's no make file for it, you can create one fairly easily. You know, it might take a few iterations to apply whatever patches are necessary. But yeah, so anything you want. Have you ever heard of somebody using this to build um, raw band radio? What kind? Raw band radio, like, like packet radio or um, low power? You could, yeah. If it's got an interface that Linux can get to, then yes. Right. Yeah, so the, the number of interfaces that are available on these things is somewhat limited because they're you know, not designed for that. But um, this one has USB. Uh, some devices, have, I have a, an x86 board that's got uh, an IDE 44, you know, essentially a laptop um, pinout uh, uh, IDE port. Uh, there's newer ones with PCI Express and a variety of other things. Yes. 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 You bring your smartphone <laughs> and you look at each box and you figure out what the model is. You know, these N number number things aren't the model number. That's the class of, of N radio they supposedly have. So you have to. Yeah, and you need to. You need to you need to know the model number and the version, if it says, because that'll tell you, because the, you know, the manufacturers will swap whole architectures out from under you. Uh, so you have to be a little careful. This one is tricky, because sometimes it's printed on the device, so you've got to crack open the box sometimes. Yes. Because they'll just use the same package. So, yeah. Right. Oh, so the other thing I'll just say is, get a damn, if you're going to start hacking on routers, get a serial console cable. They're like, a dollar fifty from China, and you only have to wait two months. Or if you're if you're in more of a hurry, you can get them for five bucks. Or you know if you're really really in a you can use a Raspberry Pi or something. But um, people are constantly saying, "Oh, I bricked my router," or "I need to JTAG this," and no one has ever JTAGged the thing outside the factory. No one has the slightest idea how to do it. But they go and buy all the expensive JTAG stuff and just get a damn serial console and find out where it is on your board and all sorts of mysteries will vaporize. You'll, you'll actually see whether it's booting, it, you might get a, the bootloader console and you can do stuff from there. So um, uh, I was you know, way late because the first device I used, I had to have one to, to reflash, but there's a cavalcade of people. They always go for the biggest hammer first and they think they need to JTAG and it's and you say, don't, you don't need to serial all the way. So anyway, that's about it, unless people have any more questions. Have you break something to an un Not with software. <laughs> I plugged in. So you have to watch out the, the, par the uh, barrel connectors for 5 volts and, and 12 volts are often identical. And it turns out that there are capacitors in these things. And even though I had unplugged the 12 volt thing and plugged the 5 volt into the wall, I looked down, oh, here's the end of a connector. And I plugged that in, and there was a, a brief light. And then, <laughs> and then it went away. Now, it turns out there was a little Zener diode thing inside that I could desolder, and, and it had fried. And magically, it came back to life. So, yeah, it's, I never, was, I don't think I've ever, I've ever bricked anything with software.
So, yeah. It's fun. You know, you got something you want to do that you don't want to monitor on that this, these things can handle, you know, they're great. Exactly. <laughs> oh, right. Did they? I didn't. I don't remember that one. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So enjoy. Thank you.